topic I'd like to talk about today is the topic of how not to inadvertently jinx or double bind our clients, which is obviously a very interesting topic. It's an extremely interesting topic from the point of view that if we are therapists, then a whole reason for being is to help our clients. And yet, by being inattentive, we can do the exact opposite very easily. And one thing that strikes me very clearly is that no one ever taught me or mentioned anything about double binding clients when I was at college or ever since for that matter. So I, I find myself thinking, why? This is something that's pretty important. Why? Is it never mentioned? Now, of course, if it so happened that you want to go into it, you could easily do research yourself and look up double binds and look up what people have had to say about it, look up um, what Gregory Bateson has had to say about it, what R.D. Lang has had to say about it, and that would be great. But the whole point is that unless you know that there is such a thing or your attention is drawn to it, why are you going to, you're not going to go researching it in the first place? So there really ought to be some mention of it. Even though there's no point in sitting around whinging and moaning about what should be but isn't. But it's still good to draw attention to it. One way in which we very easily double bind our clients is by our incautious or clumsy use of the term or the, the notion of responsibility. Possibly no term has been subject to so much abuse, to so much misuse than the word responsibility. Generally, in, in, in society as a whole, when we hear it, what it really means is, when we get to the heart of it, what it really means is um, it's, it's coercion, basically. We've been told what it is we should be doing, what it is we should be thinking, what it is we should be. And then in the next breath, we're told that it is our responsibility to do this or to be that. But of course, it's not our responsibility. It's um, if I'm trying to trap someone and make and double bind them, then my job is to make them think it's their responsibility so that then they accept the blame for when it never works out. And I can rub my hands and say, well, I did my best, or we just, you know, you just, just won't take responsibility, et cetera, et cetera. So if I tell you about what your responsibility is, what I really mean is um, what I see as being your responsibility. In other words, what I see you should be doing in order to fit in with my ideas. So really that's coercion, mind control, whatever the hell you want to Call it. And yet responsibility implies some kind of giving back to the individual <laughs> certain rights or certain um, freedoms. But, but actually it means completely the difference from the way that we usually use it. And if we actually look into what responsibility means, it's a total minefield. We never ever do look into what responsibility action actually means. We, we freely bandy the word around and we love using the word. We don't love examining what we're saying or the basis for what we're saying. We don't love that at all. If we did, we'd stop using the word so freely. Our responsibility is not what we think it is in mental health terms. And the reason it isn't is because our ability to 
free ourselves from mental health conditions is a non-existent thing. The self-construct cannot free itself from the afflictions that are attendant upon being the condition of being a self-construct any more than the thinking mind can free itself from the limitations that actually constitute the thinking mind. So if you're a thinking mind, maybe you are, and I say to you, it's your responsibility to free yourself from yourself or look beyond yourself, you can't because it's just not fair for me to say that because thought cannot do that. The thinking mind cannot jump over itself. It can't. It's a mechanical system. It cannot jump over itself. It cannot engage in transcendence. If I believe it is and you keep haranguing me and saying I should be able to cure or fix the problems that are afflicting me as a result of my thought process, then you're double binding me because there's nothing I can do about it anyway, just so long as I'm operating under this particular system, the operating system of the thinking mind, which is a mechanical system. But we don't like to pay too much attention to, to that because it's very, very important for us to cling to this idea that we have of personal causation, personal agency, personal efficacy. And by clinging to that, we miss the point. The point being that who we are is autonomous does have the ability to do, as Gurdjieff says, does have agency. But we've been constrained from the very beginning, not, that's the education process, not to be who we are. We've been constrained to be something else, a kind of mechanical version or edition of who we are. And in that case, to harp on about personal causation or personal agency is to gloss over the fact that we have been coerced to um, live life as a mechanical version, a robot version of ourselves, That's how we gloss over it. And the fact that this causes us lots of problems later on in terms of self-blaming, self-criticism, feeling bad about ourselves is also the good because if we were caught up in all that business we'll never see um, the nature of the trick that has been perpetrated on us. So all these bad feelings they're very very useful from the point of view of continuing the game because the more I blame myself the more stuck in the game I am because blaming myself is part of the game. So essentially we're talking about a game and we're talking about what mental health means within the context of that game, which is not acknowledged as a game and what mental health means within the game is that I continue to believe in personal causation, personal agency. I continue to believe that this is who I really am and I'm a free being. And I'm doing what I want to do, not what I've been conditioned to want to do. So that's very, very important. Otherwise, there is no gain. But as I was saying, the fact that we do assume this double binds us. It double binds me to think that I ought to be able to be um, personally efficacious when living as a mechanical or robot-like version of myself. And, and, and this constitutes a cloud that I can walk under or sit under a dark cloud that'll make me feel bad. And that's part of the game too. That's okay. That's also good for the game. So mental health in the terms of the game isn't mental health at all. It's a continuing state of ignorance. So that's where the confusion goes because we don't know that we're playing a game. 
that identifying with the self construct is a game because it's not who we really are. It's who we are pretending to be without knowing it. And so it's inevitable that we're, when we start talking and thinking in, about mental health, we're going to jinx ourselves. That's inevitable. It, Anyway, that wouldn't have happened, would have been if we'd have had actual insight into what our predicament is. And we don't. Our loyalty is to the set of values, the way of understanding the world that we've been um, taught. And then we want to use that set of values, that way of understanding the world to um, do things, to be a therapist or to be whatever the hell it is that we are. So social adaptation or social conformity is taken for granted and you can really see this in um, lots of um, caring professions we want to do the best that we can and so we don't question we don't be a rebel but the only trouble is unless we are a rebel unless we question we're not effective we're just part of the wall of denial. We're part of the game that doesn't admit itself to be a game. So coming back to responsibility. What is our responsibility? Like if I am suffering from a mental health condition, what is my responsibility in this? Being aware the whole time that this is an extremely treacherous word to be using and it's been mistreated a lot in the past which means it's really hard to see the word in any kind of honest way but we can go over the possibilities so the first possibility is what we could call the naive view so if i have a wart that needs removing or an ingrowing toenail or whatever the hell and i go to see my gp and he refers me to um, a specialist and then i go for an operation in this case the ingrowing toenail, the wart, or whatever it is, um, is not my responsibility. I hand it over. I'm actually probably even um, unconscious at the time, so obviously it's not my responsibility. I hand it over. And that's fine because I, there's not a lot to be, generally speaking, it doesn't really help to be conscious during an operation and be trying to take a bit of responsibility for what's going on because we don't know what we should be doing anyway, plus the fact we're probably going to be really scared and say, do, you know, not acting in a, in a very objective way. So obviously that's good. So we tend to think the same thing in mental health, that we come over, come to, to see a specialist and hand over our problems. And that's the difficult bit. Once we got there, we hand it over, it's like, phew. They're going to take care of it for me now. And that, of course, is a very, very common thing. So many people say that. And then they start to realise, well, it doesn't work like that. Because mental health is different from, you know, physical health. I mean, in, admittedly, in physical health, after we've had the intervention, it's still our responsibility to live you know, healthily. Rather than having 10 pints a day and eating loads of fried breakfast. But in terms of mental health, it is different. <coughs> because it's not possible to objectify whatever it is I'm suffering from and say it's outside of me like a <clears throat> like a wart or like an ingrowing toenail I can't say it's this thing and you can take care of it because even though I'd like to objectify it or split it off and make it into a thing I can't it's too intimate for that because if I'm anxious, the anxiety isn't a thing that I can hand over. The anxiety is in me and I'm in the anxiety. It is my mode of being in the world. It is me. I am the anxiety. Even though some people would not like to hear that. Because they would say, oh, well, I'm anxious at the moment. I'm suffering from anxiety, but I'm not the anxiety. But you are, when you're anxious, you are the anxiety. Just as when you're angry, you are the anger. 
because in all of these things we identify with a particular viewpoint, a particular identity, <coughs> and that viewpoint or identity or sense of self we identify with is an anxious identity, an anxious sense of self. So I'm not saying it's who we really are, but who we really are doesn't come into it because none of us ever <clears throat> get to grips with that. It's who we think we are. And because we've identified with this self, we have to suffer on that self's behalf. Because you can't identify with a particular sense of self without taking on board <coughs> all the and then it's the problems that that sense of self is there to. The answer would be to disidentify. But we don't do that. We'd rather imagine that the problem is something separate from us so I can carry on being this identity and yet not suffer from the problems that the identity will always be afflicted with. Because the self construct, the life of the self construct, as the Buddha pointed out <coughs> in his first noble truth, is suffering. And that's, that's the condition of its existence. It can exist in the provisional way that it does exist, but it will have to suffer. And um, that's why in the West we really didn't like the first noble truth. You know, there's lots of stuff about Buddhism we can dig. But the first noble truth is like, whoa, these guys are so negative. We want to celebrate life. Life is meaningful. Life is um, creative, joyous. It's um, full of all these possibilities. And you come along and say it's, and the Buddha comes along and he says it's pain. And that even when we think we're having a good time, as Wei Wu Wei says, we're actually suffering, but we just don't realise it. So our pleasure is suffering too. And that's even more hard hitting than what the Buddha said. Even our pleasure is pain. So we don't like to hear that. But the reason we don't like to hear it, it's, it's because when we talk about life, we're really talking about the life of the self-construct. This little phony little identity, which is really an avatar we're playing. It's just like a, a game of make believe. So, very ridiculously, we want to play this game of make believe and not acknowledge that it's a game of make believe and then claim that life is great, but the life lived by this idea that we have about ourselves is great. That Full of possibilities, creative, etc. But it isn't, because the whole thing's bullshit from beginning to end. Because the life I have when I'm pretending to be this person that doesn't exist, this identity, this ego, is not any of those things. It's not full of possibilities. It's not got any possibilities in it at all. It's not creative. Quite the opposite. It's robotic. There's no freedom in it because I'm 100% caught up the whole time in veiling the truth for myself, which I have to do if I'm to play the game, I have to veil the truth that actually this isn't me and these wishes and desires and wants aren't mine, they're just what have been foisted upon me. I have to identify with all that shit and I have to say this is me, these are my volitions, these are my, this is what I actually want, not this is what I have been compelled to want by um, the mechanical, uh, rules which define my mechanical existence. So most of the time I'm fighting, I'm constantly engaged in veiling the truth for myself and coming up with all the stuff where I say how great life is or life isn't suffering when I secretly mean the life of the <clears throat> ego, the life of the self construct isn't suffering. It's, it's, it's transparently ridiculous. <coughs> so 
So that in a nutshell is why we in the West don't like the Buddha's first noble truth. But that doesn't mean that life is crap or reality is crap. Uh, reality, it's awful, we just have to endure it. Ah, oh, it's terrible, it's just an awful, pointless burden. I mean, there, you know, you, there is a philosophy, there are philosophies that you could go down that would agree with you on that. That we have to put up with life and it's essentially non, it's kind of um, Calvinistic or something. But our, our lot is to endure it out of some sense of duty, out of some sense of responsibility and not look for enjoyment or happiness. And not have fun. Having fun's a bad thing, isn't, isn't it? When, when, when you're talking about the Puritans or the Calvinists or whatever. So the only thing we've got to live for is this sense of duty. I have to carry on, even though it's crap. Maybe I'll reward, be rewarded later in heaven. That's always um, one good motivating factor. But the point that I'm trying to make is that that is not at all what the Buddha meant. If I may presume to say what the Buddha meant, I think it's clear enough what the Buddha meant. That the existence of the ego is always going to be crap. It's always going to be pain because it's lived on a false basis. It's lived in a narrow self-seeking way that separates us from our true um, nature. So if I live life in a narrow self-seeking way that separates me from my true nature and the true nature of reality, how the hell is that ever going to work out for me?